How's it going, everybody? Monday morning quarterback, episode 170. We're going to have to have a party when we get to 200. Uh, we are going to start this week's show by answering the questions that we received last week, either through comments, direct message, email, whatever. Um, so that's kind of the new format of the show. We'll cover a topic. And if you have a question, whether it's regarding tonight's topic or anything else racing-wise, Reach out to us in some form or fashion. Again, a comment, direct message, an email, and uh, we'll get that answered for you and then share uh, with the audience. So first question I got last week was, how many races should a torsion bar last? And I think we briefly touched on that um, last week, but basically the torsion bar, <clears throat> um, whether it's a solid or a tubular bar, it has a yield point of where the bar is going to fail. And so... The closer you run it to that yield point, um, the shorter the lifespan is, basically. So you're going to run out of um, your nine lives. So uh, on a sprint car, I think it, depending on the size of the bar and the size of the gun drilled hole, it's, it's roughly 30 degrees at twist is where yield is. Typically, we're operating under 20 in normal racing applications. Um, but on a rough racetrack, you might get closer to that point. Or if you flip and land back on your wheels, um, you're certainly going to exceed that threshold. Um, now, just because it gets to yield one time doesn't necessarily mean it's junk, but it's certainly not good for it. Um, so typically, we tell people 20, 25 races, discard them, start new. If you flip big on night one and land back on your wheels, those bars are probably junk. Um, if you race on an extremely rough racetrack week after week after week, they're probably not going to make it to 20 nights uh, before you need to replace those. So if you have questions on how to check those bars without a bar dyno, catch episode 169 from last week and we cover that. Um, but typically 20 to 25 races, average track conditions. That's not seeing a lot of trauma. All right. Um, number two. Go into more detail on the side-to-side -side movement in the shaft. So last week I had a complete shock, and I showed you if it was fully extended and the shock had some play, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, all shocks have a certain amount of that. Um, this particular person wanted me to go in a little more depth on that. So um, basically from this circlip down is what's exposed in the rod guide. So this is a six-inch shaft. So inside this rod guide or shaft bearing, whatever you'd like to call it, um, this shaft is only being supported by about a half of an inch. Um, and, and that's for a reason, right? If we supported the whole thing, there'd be a tremendous amount of drag. There wouldn't be much room for misalignment in the movement of the suspension. So if you're only holding it by a half inch and you have all this leverage out here, sure, there's going to be some side to side play. A brand new shock has that regardless of the maker model um, and that's why so as you push the shock in the in the body and you have less leverage um, that play starts to go away right and as you get it closer all the way in you'll basically have no play um, you're very rarely operating your shock out at full extension um, so it's not an issue um, but that was just explaining that because we've gotten that we've gotten that call a few times where guys like I'm going to send my shock going to be rebuilt. It seems like its shaft's got a lot of play. This very rarely wears out from a shaft. And if it does, it's typically because there's a ton of misalignment. We would see it more when we did more modified and street stock shocks because trying to run like stock control arms and stuff. And then however the guy mounted the shock on the chassis, there was a lot more um, <clears throat> interference and misalignment than there is in a midget or a sprint car. Another one I got was... Um, and I didn't cover this last week, was what's the difference uh, between like a shock weeping oil or leaking oil or how much of a leak is too much of a leak? Um, and that's a great question. So most of the high performance shocks in our industry run a pretty low drag seal. And by that, I mean, they don't grab onto the shaft super tight because that creates friction and drag. Um, now, like the shocks that are on your street car, man, they grab the shaft tight um, because they're meant to go, you know, a couple hundred thousand miles in between service. We're not running them that long, um, and we're more about the performance of the shock than making sure it doesn't leak oil for 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so if the shock sits for a period of time and there's just a little bit of wetness um, around the seal or a little 
slight ring of wetness on the shaft. Um, that's not bad. If oil's running down the shock shaft, starting to puddle up, that's an issue. And when it gets that low on oil, you'll start to get that dead spot in the shock that we talked about last week. Um, as we're heading into winter, it's really important. Don't leave your shocks outside in the trailer because when it gets close to below freezing, um, those seals get hard. And then the first time you use them, <clears throat> the little bit they are supposed to grab the shaft, they're not going to because the durometer of the seals really hard. Um, and it can weep some oil on those initial movements until you get that um, seal back in a, a working temperature range. Um, the last one I got was <clears throat> shock um, leaking air pressure. Probably 95% of the time that we encounter this, it's one of two things. Either the inflation tool isn't sealing on the Schrader valve or the Schrader valve core has come loose. One way to check for sure if you have an internal shock issue is if you depress the Schrader valve and oil shoots out, that means it's leaking um, oil into the gas chamber, which it shouldn't. So most shocks, uh, monotube shocks, have a divider piston. This keeps the air on one side of the shock and the oil on the other, and there's seals here. So if, if you think that your shock is leaking air, that means it's going past these seals into the oil chamber. That also means that oil can get into the air chamber. So if you depress the Schrader valve and it shoots oil out, that is an issue that needs resolved. Your shock needs rebuilt. Um, if you do that, no oil comes out, but you still think it's leaking pressure, make sure the valve core is tight um, and make sure that your inflation tool is sealing properly on your valve core. We have some videos on this um, that we've done in the past. I don't have that here off the top of my head, but there are some videos on that. So that answers last week's questions. Let's dive into tonight's topic. Which, it, which is rear shock rebound. So we get this question a lot when the track slicks off, um, should I open up my left rear shock and decrease rebound and, and add rebound to the right rear? Um, and, and what's that look like? Wing, non-wing, micro, sprint car, whatever. Um, it's not a super simple answer, um, but what I'll tell you is most all of our applications are running a solid axle. Right, so you're on a solid axle. So whatever you do to one side of the car affects the other. So if you go down on the left rear, what happens? The right rear comes up. If you go down too far on the right rear, what happens? The left rear comes up. <clears throat> our cars don't have a tremendous amount of travel. These aren't dirt late models. There's not a nine inch shock in the left rear. So it's a balancing act. To get maximum drive, your left rear and right rear tire both need to be in the racetrack. If one's this way, or this way, now you're driving off one tire or the other. So how do you balance that? Um, old school train of thought was when the track slicks off, take rebound out of the left rear to stick the right rear tire to get more side bite from the center of the corner off, more lateral grip. Um, it does that, but as you take rebound out of the left rear, you lose left rear drive because now rather than the left rear staying down and loaded, it's coming up. Um, you see the dirt late models run around the track with the left rear fully extended and on the right front. They're steering the car with the steering wheel, and the more you can load the right front and help it turn, the better off you are. In a sprint car, you're steering it most of the time with the throttle, uh, more than you are the front, the front tire. So as the track slows down, whether you're running wing or non-wing, um, we have to get the right rear tire more into play to get more right rear grip. That's the biggest tire on the car. So how do we load that and get both forward and lateral grip? Um, in a wing application, typically that means we're going to add a little bit of rebound to the left rear and a little bit of rebound to the right rear. Um, probably a touch more to the right rear than the left rear. That's going to get both rear tires driving and get maximum traction. Um, in non-wing, we will take a little bit of rebound out of the left rear and then add a, a decent amount to the right rear. And when I say a little bit, you don't want to overstep it because again, if you take too much out of the left rear and we get all to the right rear, now we have no left rear drive. 
Okay. The reason we're taking a little bit out, we run a lot more rebound non-wing than we do wing. If you just add it to the right rear, um, a lot of times that just hunkers the back of the car down. Our ride heights get too low. Our roll center gets too low. Our arm angles get out of whack. Um, so we're just going to release the left rear a little bit, open it up a little bit, add a little more bleed, and let the car do what it wants, get to the right rear, get some side bite without taking out too much left rear drive. And that is from micros to sprint cars, the same philosophy um, plays true. When you start getting into higher end wing racing, there's more things to consider as far as, you know, wing speed being decreased when the track slows down or if you're starting farther back in the track and how we need to do that. Um, you would probably run a slightly different rebound setting if you're starting on the front row of a wing sprint car race versus if you're starting on row seven or eight and you're back there in dirty air um, because we need to have the, the car keep a good attitude when there's no air on the wings. Um, so we might dive into that topic a little more in a future episode um, because there's a lot to unpack there um, as far as tuning for dirty air versus clean air. Um, so that, that could be a good topic down the road. But if you have questions pertaining to tonight's topic, or any other one, please um, drop us a line so we can answer those for you. And uh, as always, please like and share the video. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back here Monday at 9 p.m. next week.